Welcome to tonight's uh, event as part of the University Special of Ideas. I'm Roger Shannon, and I'm the Associate Director of ICE, which is your host for this evening. ICE is the Institute for uh, Creative Enterprise and is one of the research institutes at the university. And tonight, uh, as you know, we, we will be um, launching and discussing Professor Jeff Beattie's new novel. And uh, as an introduction and welcome, I've just got some uh, descriptions about our two speakers this evening. Professor of Psychology at Edgefield University, Jeff Beattie is an internationally renowned writer and broadcaster who has taught and researched at numerous universities, including the University of Manchester and the University of California, Santa Barbara. He's best known for his detailed analyses of nonverbal communication, which has featured in a large number and volume of academic articles and books and which also led to his featuring as Big Brother's resident on-screen psychologist for 11 series. Widely regarded as one of the leading international figures on non-verbal communication, he has also published 20 books on a range of topics, many of which have either won or been shortlisted for national or international prizes. He is a fellow of the British Psychological Society and the Royal Society of Medicine, and his knowledge of how non-verbal communication reveals hidden thoughts, has been featured on many TV programmes, both nationally and internationally. Of late, he has also been a keen interpreter of the body language of football managers, including Jose Mourinho, as well as decoding the body language of Donald Trump. <laughs> Two individuals we could say are vertiginously verbose, even when saying nothing. Jeff is also a published novelist, and his first novel was The Corner Boys, the story of James growing up in a loyalist, working-class neighbourhood. But this evening, we are celebrating the arrival of his second novel, The Body's Little Secrets. I'm pleased to say that Jeff will be discussing his new novel with our visitor to the campus today, the novelist and screenwriter Helen Cross. <laughs> Helen is the author of four novels, including My Summer of Love, which won a Betty Trask Award, and became a BAFTA and European Film Award, award-winning film directed by the Polish director Paweł Pawlikowski. She's recently adapted her novels Spilt Milk and Black Coffee for producers Rebecca Gilbertson at Rainy Day Films. Her short stories have appeared in various anthologies and magazines, including most recently the Manchester Review. Her radio dramas, which are regularly broadcast by the BBC, have been shortlisted for several major awards, including Best Audio Drama and the Innovation Award, both in the BBC Drama and Music Awards. Her audio drama about the Women's World Cup was broadcast as an episode of From Fact to Fiction on BBC Radio 4 in 2015. Ministry of Women, her graphic novel, created with and illustrated by Carol Adlam, was published in June 2016. Helen was radio dramatist in residence in the School of English, Birmingham City University, for, for which she is a fellow of the Institute of Creative and Critical Writing at BCU. Originally from Yorkshire, her novels are frequently set in her home, White Rose County, with My Summer of Love set against the backdrop of the miners' strike during the Thatcher period. So this evening, we will have some readings from Jeff, discussions with Helen, and at the end, some book signings and some book selling, I hope. But just to set the uh, evening going with a focus on Jeff's novel, it's published by Gibson Square Books and is set in Sheffield during the Thatcher era and centres on a young Cambridge-educated psychologist who is both new to undergraduate teaching at Sheffield University and new to the North and to the culture of the North. Matt has always closely observed those around him as a means to figure them out, but when his brother, the golden child of the family, dies in a freak accident, Matt feels afloat. In the hope of keeping some connection, he decides to move to the northern city where his brother lived as a working class activist. As such, the novel is a kind of 1980s lucky Jim, crossed with a north-south culture clash. A shy and sensitive academic Matt frequents the demimonde of a city that's had its industrial base politically bottomed out by Thatcher right economics. Matt ventures forth 
into the night economy of hard clubs and even harder bouncers. The only economy stirring in the city, save for the economy of higher education within map, toils daily on research projects. However, it is this pioneering research that he draws on in order to survive in a world of gestural threats, the optics of menace, and a non-academic body language, which is a purely physical thesaurus all of its own. The body's little secrets. Jeff will now do some readings of the book to give you a sense of the tone, the <laughs> flavour of the book, <laughs> before which we can have a discussion. Yeah. 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 Right, I'm obviously not used to this reading business, uh, um, so I, I should just set up a bit. Uh, Roger asked me to, to, to find some bits I should read from, and um, it's described as a semi-autobiographical novel. And people who know me well, there are one or two people in the room, um, keep saying to me, oh my god, which bits are true, which are made up. They're horrified that it all could be true. Um, so, so some of it's obviously, uh, you know, I'm drawing upon my own um, experiences to kind of write it. So some of the bits are quite painful, and I couldn't do a reading about those bits. So I decided to start at the beginning of the book, because I thought, once the beginning, so it's easy to read from. Uh, but I should set it up, it's, as you will see, it's a relationship between two individuals. And part of my, my motivation for doing the book is this notion that the psychologist is always the ghost floating about, observing humanity, and nothing of the psychologist ever appears in, in, in psychological writings. And of course, that's far from true. The psychologist is part of the scene in which he or she does the observations. And, and that's really what the book's about. And I, and I suppose the moral of the book, and I don't want to preempt any discussion, but the moral of the book is the psychologist is as prone to the economic and social pressures as anyone else. So this is me and, and a guy called Lenny, and I don't want to ruin the book for you, but the, it looks as if they're going to observe some genuine violence right in front of them. In actual fact, they're watching a video. So I've just spoiled the whole book. But, <laughs> but, but, but the whole book's about the fact that we make observations from people we've not met. We judge from videos. Psychologists do it. People do it. So, so let me try and read. We were sitting in the dark and smoke-filled room towards the far wall, where the smoke hung like, like thick cloud. We had picked our seats carefully not to be near the fog of smoke, but for other reasons. He was already there in front of us. The hard nut he was going to do him. Mr. Big, we were calling him already, and we hadn't seen him close up yet. Big Lenny had suggested the name. He knew a few Mr. Biggs. This was just another one. We were waiting for the others to arrive at the drinking club. We knew that there was going to be serious violence that night. We had heard all about Mr. Big. This Mr. Big, and what he was capable of. Serious violence. I laugh when I catch myself saying it. It kind of slips off the tongue like other expressions worn down into cliché and euphemism. It slips between your fingers like a pellet of wet soap, hard to get hold of, slippery, invasive. It sounds like police argot, loitering with intent, a fray, serious violence. Important sounding words, a bit slippery that makes something out of nothing to help the police out in their bureaucratic travails. Lenny liked using the expression it became worn and smooth in his large horny hands. He threatened punters with it, the ordinary punters. Slippery fuckers, he called them, all of them. So what did we really know about what was going to happen that night at the club? We knew that somebody was going to lose their life that night. We knew that, and that's as about as serious as, it, as you can get, even by Lenny standards. I checked the time by glancing at my watch. I wasn't as surreptitious as all that. I moved my arm up steadily against my body and pulled the sleeve of my jacket back slowly and carefully. But I could see the muscles of his eyes almost clench. Patience, whispered Big Lenny out of the corner of his mouth. His bottom lip all extended. Patience. Just try and relax. You're making me nervous. He stressed the nerve syllable of nervous rather than the mere. I noticed that. I like to think that I'm a good observer of people. He started to light up another cigarette. The match lisped twice across the sandpaper and then crackled into life. It sounded loud and intrusive in that room, with all the tension hanging. This action of his made me anxious, but I didn't comment on it. The privileges of power, I thought to myself. Privileges that he negotiated for himself through that mouth of his, and those large horny hands, with knuckles that were misshapen and swollen. 
I've got knuckles on my knuckles, he would say, and the lads would all laugh. It takes years of careful nurturing to get them to look like this. I was somehow accountable for everything that I did in that room, but he wasn't. It seemed unfair, but that was the way he'd made it. We sat side by side. We knew roughly what was going to happen on night the drink club. We'd been warned. Or rather, I'd been warned. Lenny was my guest. I needed the support, and he wanted to be in love. I'm game for anything, he said. Anything like this, that is. And he had laughed, which I thought was curious. And anyone else I would interpret it as a sign of tension, but not him. I was just waiting quietly for what I knew was inevitable. Not the murder itself, but a wave of revulsion in it. I wasn't the victim. It wasn't the victim I was concerned about. It was me. I had to watch it all in front of Lenny, like a child on a seashore in a storm watching the tides roll towards me. A violence that couldn't be stopped to turn back at the stage. There was an inevitability about the whole thing. I glanced at Big Lenny, his bulk reassured me. I was new to this game. I was the child here. I watched the calluses on his hand move towards his mouth and the ash of the cigarette glow in the half-light like a red pulsating ganglion. The thought occurred to me that this is all we are. A collection of pulsating nerves that could be extinguished by a guy like him over there. The guy sitting with the beer in his hand at the bar. Not a care in the world. Or a guy like Lenny. Carefree individuals. Careless with other people's lives. So, so the point about, about the story of the book is that I'm watching, I know that a murder is about to happen because I've been sent a, a videotape to analyse as a forensic psychologist. Um, and the idea is that Lenny, I brought Lenny along to watch it with me for reassurance and help me interpret it. But of course, um, so I, I'm, and I'm most concerned about how he's going to respond to me watching the murder unfold. Mm -hmm. so that's the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do I sit down now? Oh, do yeah, I read them? Yeah. You, you have the second one. Oh, I did another bit. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. I'm new to this game as well. <laughs> in many games I'm used to. Okay, now I, I wanted something a little bit lighter. And um, the, the reason I was interested in this whole business of videotape and so on, it's not just the psychologist analyzed behavior. The police do it, of course. Bouncers do it. And then this particular club that I, that I centered a lot of the action on, uh, the big thing that they did in the evenings was at 2 o'clock when, when the club closed, everyone was asked to leave except for the select few, the VIPs. Mm -hmm. And they stayed behind. And the VIPs were the, were, the, were the gangsters from Sheffield. The CID, of course, who were friends of the gangsters. Um, a few millionaires or fake millionaires, they stayed behind. And the owner of the club, his uh, party piece was he would edit all of the CCTV footage of violence onto a, a showreel, you know, all the, all the highlights together. And he would do a voiceover as the violence unfolded. And, and that was what was done for recreation. So at, at 2 a.m. to 5 a.m., they would watch the videos, and the, the owner of the club would hear from the bouncers who were there what had been said, he'd memorize it, and then he would do the script. So, and, and, should, and the, the, the best videos would be shown month after month. Okay, so, so this, this is the background, otherwise, otherwise you'll not really understand what this is about. So we're all sitting there at 4 a.m., the psychologist, the CID, and the gangsters all watching a bit of video. There was a light on the top right-hand corner of the foyer of the club, which bathed the right-hand side of the person in bright white light. <coughs> it made day for the spare hair look quite serene, but quite ghostly. Everything in the club was bright and light. Everything outside was in the dark. This punter wanted to go from the dark to the light. Why he was being prevented was not clear. He was just barred for some minor, or perhaps major misdemeanor. Nobody seemed to know who he was. He would have to be a nobody to be barred. That was the logic. So this guy's running into the club. The punter kept putting, putting his head around the door and getting a knockback. That's what they, call, they called it, a knockback. It was a nice vague term. It wasn't like being barred. It had no temporal dimension written into it. If you were barred, you'd be barred for a set period of time. If punters got barred, you would want to know how long they were barred for. If you got a knockback, you couldn't legitimately inquire about the duration. Plus, it had no motive as part of its sentence. You could have a knockback on a whim or something vaguely remembered by the door personnel. You didn't have to really justify a knockback if you were a bouncer. You just had to be resolute, resolute for the duration of one evening. Just one evening. Come back tomorrow, the bouncer would say. Come and we'll see. The incident of the video was just a knockback, but it was being contested. The punter wasn't going anywhere. He was digging his heels in. Metaphorically speaking, 
He was quite literally being a bloody nuisance. He was standing there protesting, breaking every rule about authority and order, and who is the final say? This was worse than being a muppet, fat Eddie's eyes. We all sat there watching the man with the perm. Pete had now joined us. I, I'm sorry, there is a bit of swearing here. Fucking asshole, said Fat Eddie. If I had a knockback, I would just fuck off home or to another club. No offence, lads. As that cunt got no proud. The man with the perm stood there outside the club, arguing away, then flicked a cigarette into the night. He looked like a tracer going through the black night air. Some girl came out and whispered in the ear of the dead bouncer. She kissed him on the cheek. The bouncer mouthed something after her, but because there was no sound on the video, it was hard to tell what this might be. The punter with the perm looked down the steps after the girl. He got more agitated now. He was remonstrating with the bouncer. You could see these sharp, stabbing, platonic gestures emanating from him. He's fucking asking for it, said Paladin. What would you do to him, Cliff, if he was in police custody and he started pointing his finger at you like that? I bet that you would knock his lights out. I noticed that Fat Eddie was sweating. He'd also gone noticeably paler. Fat Eddie took drugs. Everybody knew that. They made him sweat. Look, that's better, said Fat Eddie, pointing at the screen. He's put his hands in his pocket now. Come on, Mr. Psychologist, what does that mean? So, the, the narrator's being called upon to speak. That pale drawn face with the dark circle of eyes turned my way. The police inspector looked up from his pint of lager expectantly. It's hard to say, I said. I gave a little shrug to indicate my nonchalance. It was the first time I'd talked all that night. Hard to fucking say, said Faladi. Hard to fucking say. He had pinched the muscles around his eyes to make a squinting sort of face. He rotated his head to fix eye contact with each member of the group in turn sitting in a loose sort of circle. Hard to fucking say. He tried to coax a little smile from each person in turn, a smile or a laugh, like a beggar with a cap working in theatre audience. He wasn't disappointed. I'm sorry, there's so much swearing. It's <laughs> shocking. I was there. I'm just scanning the sentence coming up. And, you know, one more. Do they pay you for these opinions up at that university? He said. Hard to fucking say. Is that what you come up with when they bring some fucker? Sorry. <laughs> when they bring some fucker. <laughs> say this. It's easier to write than read, I have to say. Is that what you. Oh, Jesus. Is that, what you, is that what you come up with when they bring some fucking nutter in to see you? It's hard to say. And you're meant to be the expert on this. Come on, Cliff, give us a professional opinion. He stressed the word professional. What does the hands in the pockets mean from a professional point of view? Cliff, he's the police senior, very senior policeman. Cliff set his pint of lager down slowly on the black metallic table. He made a solid clanking sound. He cleared his throat. It made him sound serious, as if the opinion he was about to express was the end product of a great deal of deliberation. I could imagine him going through the same routine in court. I would say, he began. I would say. He started again in a little rhetorical flourish. That it means that he, the man in question, the suspect, the punter, as we say around here, recognises the seriousness of what he's got himself involved in. And that at this point in the proceedings, he's having second thoughts. Serious second thoughts about continuing with his course of action. He gave a, co a cough to mark the end point of his testimony. Excellent, said Father Lee. Fucking tremendous. You see, Mr. Psychologist, some professions can read people like books. That was tremendous, Cliff. How do you know all that from just one simple act? Years of honest, decent police training, said Cliff, picking up his full pint mug. His pint mug that was being used against all the rules out there in the wine bar. You're not allowed to have pint mugs in the wine bar. He looked very self-satisfied with his own performance. Years of watching the evil bastards make their moves, he said and getting in there first before they've even made up their own minds about what nasty things to do. It gives you quite an edge on them, I can tell you that for nothing. But what you've just said is not very scientific, I said, quickly and quite quietly, and I must confess without much reflection on my part. Not very what, said Fat Eddie, with that squinting face of his. It's not very scientific, I said, more slowly and more deliberately. <laughs> Listen, said Cliff, sitting down his longer more forcefully this time so that a large wave of lager tipped out of the side of the glass all over the table. I didn't say it was scientific. I just said that it was based on years of experience. That's not the same thing. What do you mean not scientific, asked Faraday? It's tried and tested. That's good enough for me. Well, Cliff could say what he likes, I said. He hasn't got a theory of what's going on here. Oh, I have a theory, all right, said Cliff. My theory is that assholes like that guy there have no bottom when it comes down to it. 
The drink makes them brave, but there's this little voice at the back of their mind saying, don't fucking push it. Uh, this some of books. <laughs> or this big bouncer here will knock your fucking lights out. Don't push your fucking luck. Excellent, said Fat Eddie. That's some fucking theory, that is. Does it have a name, that theory of yours? No, said Cliff. It doesn't have any fancy psychological bollocks name. It's just a common sense theory based on years of experience. I wouldn't fancy being lifted by you, Cliff, said Fat Eddie. You're too fucking clever. A mom would have no chance against you. Fat Eddie and Cliff went back to their drinking in perfect synchrony with each other. Their glasses were lifted from the table at exactly the same moment. They gulped within the same brief interval, and the glasses were put down again. Oh, the pressure coming. <laughs> <laughs> it always seems such a good idea at the keyboard to have lots of swearing when you're on your own in the room and then when you're in a school hall doing reading it's less, less a thing. Um, that was great. Thank you uh, for giving us a bit of an insight into the content of the book, which I really enjoyed reading. It's a really interesting read. And what was interesting from that, um, the extracts you chose were both quite um, busy, humorous, funny sections of the story. And one of the lovely things about the book is that there are these great kind of almost comic set pieces. Um, and then the book is ventilated with much more quieter, tender reflections on Matt's upbringing. Uh, we flash back in quite a nicely non-linear way into to his relationship with his mother, his relationship with his brother, who has died by the, the start of the book. But we move back in his memory very tenderly. And I just wondered why you were drawn to the idea of writing a novel rather than a memoir about this material. Memoirs are very fashionable at the moment and publishers love memoirs because I think we're in the age of kind of reality, aren't we? And yet you chose to do sort of the ancient technique of a imagination as well as autobiographical material. Yeah, I, I, I kind of wrote it as a novel because I, I wanted the freedom and flexibility to tell the truth. I think the problem with memoirs and, and, and non-fiction is that, that you're constrained by, by so many other factors. And I think once you call a novel, I would say The Corner Boys was the most accurate bit of writing I ever did about Northern, growing up in Northern Ireland because I called it a novel. So, 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 so I think it was that, that point. Um, the, the kind of background of the whole thing, of course, the autobiographical bit, I had you know, moved after my PhD to Sheffield. And I was meant to be an expert on human and non-verbal communication. And I suddenly came came across a city in which people were living lives, which you know, as you said at the beginning, of you're, you're decimated by by government policy. You know, all the state of works closing down, the you know, the miners' strike, you know, everyone on the dole, no such thing as society. And and I suppose what I discovered in Sheffield shocked me because I, my brother had surprise surprise had lived there, and he told me a lot about about you know the la this was going to be the last great stand for working class. Um, and I suppose I was shocked by, by, by what I saw. But the first big shock was finding this nightclub and going there one Monday evening and finding at three o'clock in, in, in a city with no money that this place was packed. And, it, and I suppose it was this fascination with, I wanted to know who these characters were. Um, and, and, you know, I was supposed to be an expert on social psychology, an expert on, on deception, an expert on how people construct lives. But I didn't really, have, I hadn't really come across anything quite like this before. And, and in some sense, in, in terms of what I then tried to do was I tried to write about it separately. But in this novel, what I've tried to do is tie the whole thing back together again, mm -hmm. to kind of give the psychologist some life. And, and I suppose what, the thing that fascinates me most, again, as I, as I alluded to at the beginning, is when psychologists do their ethnographies or act as professional strangers to write about cultures, you never see any of them come into it. You know, they're always kind of like a, you know, the proverbial fly on the wall or you know, the professional stranger, and you're not sharing much. But I suppose what struck me about this world I was trying to understand um, was that you quickly build up relationships with the people you're writing about, that, that you're mixing with. Uh, um, and that comes with a whole set of obligations and so on. And I suppose I, I wanted to explore the relationship aspects, which is why Lenny and I at the start are, are both observing something happening. Now, the, the background to that was that uh, um, because I was a body language expert, I, I was called upon to do a lot of forensic analysis or, of tapes of where you would witness someone being murdered, and the idea would be you'd go and watch that on your own. And I remember one night mentioning that to Lenny in the club, 
saying, this is what I have to do. And he said, bring me along. And I said, I can't do it. I've signed legal documentation saying, I'm going to watch the violence on my own. I'm not, I'm not sure you need to be talking about it. He said, look, you've got this real piece of gold, the ultimate snuff movie. I'd like to copy that. And I said, look, that is not possible. But just as I did with The Corner Boys, I, I thought, imagine if I had brought them along. So that's how the novel starts. The two of us watching this. And the reason it's, it's interesting is, look, we have two different perspectives on the behavior in front of us. I'm an academic psychologist. I study microbehaviors. Where do I study microbehaviors? I study them in the laboratory. I study Cambridge undergraduates interacting with each other. So I didn't, what did I know about the kind of behaviors that lead up to, to murders and floods? What did I know about that? What did I know about people who are taking cocaine and you know, and, and their its effects on interpretation? I didn't know anything about that. So, so what I'm trying to play about at the start of the novel is two different perspectives on some genuinely horrific violence. Um, and these two people are sharing their perspective on it to each other. Uh, and I, I suppose what I wanted to highlight was something about society, really, because we all... The theme of the, the Festival of Ideas is equalities, and, and by implication, inequalities. And I suppose it's this notion that you have experts who are experts on behaviour, who are body language experts. Bring the body language expert in. Get him into court. He will testify. He will explain what's going on. And yet Lenny had spent his years with a very different experience in that situation, observing the behaviours. And obviously I've got Cliff, the policeman, saying, oh, years of experience has taught me this. And you can see that Cliff's theories are really very good. They're just oh, really. uh, but, but I wanted to play with that real clash between two perspectives on something which is terribly important, which is you know, human interaction, human violence, and its antecedents and how we read it. Because until, we, you know, I couldn't project myself into the mind of the protagonists, and perhaps Lenny was a better, better place to do it. So I wanted to explore those, those kind of deep themes, but in order to explore those deep themes, I couldn't do it as a, I, it would have been problematic to do it as a memoir. Um, because Lenny is a number of different people combined, because I wanted him to have all of the attributes. But on the other hand, I did want to understand this culture, which, which was alien to me. One of the things to, that seems very um, prominent to me in the story is the idea of masculinity and this very brutal masculinity that our rather tender uh, hero, fresh from Cambridge and from a very different environment, encounters in Sheffield. Um, very bloodthirsty, very brutal, lots of fighting in the clubs. And our hero has a kind of fascination and attraction to that as much as he has a kind of fear of it. And that is mirrored very nicely in his relationship with his own brother, who has died, but he's also very jealous of and nervous of. And I wondered if you were aware of writing about masculinity in your work. It, 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 it was, it was a, a, a recurrent theme, I, I, I think, at that time. And, and I suppose, you know, from you know, speaking as a psychologist rather than a novelist, I mean, I suppose what intrigued me was that these were people who, who were on board and they had to re-establish themselves in some social hierarchy somehow. So the way they did it wasn't just by being violent towards each other. The way they did it, you're absolutely right, was to be violent and then have that violence celebrated. Mm -hmm. So the whole business about the edited CCTV stuff was they were really proud of this. They would say, have you seen tape number 16? Come on, big mm -hmm. uh, and, and they all had names, these tapes. In fact, I've still got some of them, I have to confess. Uh, and they've all got titles. And, and the, the, the guys in, the, in, the, in, in that demi mode would, would request them. they say, oh, we haven't seen that one for, for, for a good time. And then they would request the nightclub owner to come and do the voiceover. And the voiceovers were hilarious because whatever was said, it, you knew he wasn't saying it right. In fact, if you ever pointed out that the apparent, the apparent lip, because obviously they're all silent, the, the lip movements didn't match the, the script. <laughs> that was considered the biggest faux pas you could make. It's like as if you were challenging them to a fight. Come outside. That, whatever you've just said, that's not what he said. Because uh, it was part of the understanding of the balance, which is, it was almost as if uh, people had roles to play. And, and the bouncers had roles to play, and you know, the, the people who had knockbacks, the Muppets, you know, there was all categorization of victims. They had specific roles to play, and their, their language had to be appropriate for that role, so that people, strangers, although you had to be in the known to be invited, could 
help in, in, interpret it. So masculinity as celebration was absolutely core. Mm -hmm. and, and you're absolutely right, there is a, a parallel story, which is, which is a personal love story of, of a you know, brother who was, who was a mountaineer, so which is another yes. highly masculine thing, of course. But again, what I wanted to explore with that story was um, sometimes I think, you know, <clears throat> how can I say this? Um, you know, it's a very brave act, of course, but it's, it's the people who are left behind who mm -hmm. want to suffer. Yes, yes, absolutely. And also the idea that the, um, a lot of women are attracted to this sort of masculinity and our young hero, who is also finding his, his way with women and sex, and there's a sort of coming of age story at the heart of this, isn't there? It's about becoming a man and you know, how you find your way, which I thought was really nice. And to set at the time of the minor strike, as I wrote a novel set at the time of the minor strike, and actually looking back at that period, with sort of 30 years distance, it did seem an incredibly macho thing we were celebrating, this kind of fighting in the streets and fighting the police and, and Margaret Thatcher standing against this sort of macho, um, you know, celebration of working class culture. And I thought that was a lovely way to kind of give it a location for the theme as well. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree with you. Of course, it, it was a final time, but, but I suppose in the book I explore other ways that people have of adapting to that notion of... of you know, this economic you know, explosion, which 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 mm -hmm. kind of you know, Sheffield as a city was destroyed during that period, uh, and of course the the other way was deception and deceit, because the I mean the other thing I mean it, it kind of comes out in the book because some of these main characters in in this world, it took me a long time to work out who they were and what they were, because you would you would be introduced to people who would be a, a millionaire. This is a millionaire. He's worth the, in those days thirty million pounds, a lot of money, and then beside him was a guy in a white suit with the best teeth I've ever seen, which he was a bit more bigger about his, his, his economic position. But he'd, I'd walk out the club at five o'clock having watched the videos, and he'd get into the white Rolls Royce and go into the night. And I thought, wow, if this one's worth 30 million, and he's driving a Mercedes and this one's worth, he hasn't said what, perhaps he's being a bit, but he, you know. And then I discovered this chap wasn't actually employed. He was, he, well, he'd been a pipe inspector for the Yorkshire Water Authority. Um, he bought the Rolls Royce cheap. He siphoned petrol out of the vans at work to keep the car running. Um, he'd go out and tell everyone. He, he never talked about his money because that would be deceit. So, he, but if females liked him because he's obviously a multi-millionaire. He never had to buy any drinks because they wanted to say, "Look, I'm not a gold digger, you know. Uh, let me buy you a drink, okay? So, okay, madam, go ahead if you'd like to. <laughs> I'll accept a drink of you." Um, and the, the extraordinary thing about this this chap, who I became very friendly with over the years was that he had a little mental map of Shepherd in his head and he knew the distance of every place so he'd meet someone and he'd say, well, where do you live, madam? And she'd say, Pittsburgh. So he'd think, Pittsburgh, six miles. Will the petrol get me Pittsburgh back? <laughs> uh, possibly not. Oh, I've got, I've got a busy evening to spend, madam. It's like, and he'd move on to the next one until he found someone who, who, who clicked the location map. Um, so this guy was absolutely extraordinary, but... Um, and all I ever remember about him, and I can't remember if this is in the novel or not, he was obsessed with his teeth, and they were real teeth, by the way. Um, and all I, every time he drove to the club, it was an underground car park, he would have a, a phial of water, a toothpaste, and he would brush his teeth, mm -hmm. and spit it out onto the concrete. And it's a beautiful image, and I think that's in the somewhere. <laughs> and he was almost brushing his teeth. And, and again, I'm sure there's some deep psychological reason why you want to keep cleansing yourself when you tell so many lies. Yeah. But, but uh, so, so I suppose what I wanted to do was, was, was do, in some sense, pull these characters together and, and, and give the psychologist a life, an emotional life, a relationship life, a, a, you know, a home life, but also g give the psychologist a narrator to put him under the same pressures that everyone else was under, because the whole theme of the novel is that this guy's asked to do this forensic analysis. Now, anyone who's ever heard me talking about my theories of human communication knows I don't actually believe in body language at all. You know, every time, as I was chatting to Roger earlier, every time I say body language, it kind of, I have to grimace. Because my whole theory is that non-verbal communication works with language. The two systems together, it's two systems of communication. So every time someone, even when Big Brother asked me to do body language, I said, well, it's not really what I do. And I only did body language for the first two series. Then I said, look, my theory is this, and it's not my goal, that's much more interesting. Uh, it's the relationship between speech and gesture. So the whole point about the forensic stuff is that oh, there's, no, there's no sound. It's just the, the gross behaviours of the body. I'm interested in the quick things. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I put the, this narrator under the same pressure everyone else is under. Rod knew, knew me at that time, you know, trying to get going in a career, you're trying to do something, you know, and, and people say, oh, you could be famous for forensic analysis. Oh, and then they'd show me the tip, and I'm thinking, shit, there's nothing here. Mm -hmm. uh, and they say, what do you see, you know, Dr. Beasley? And I'd say, oh, wow. <laughs> and, you know, so in other words, he's, he's no different, you know, sorry, I keep talking in the first person, it's semi-autobiographical. Uh, <laughs> you understand, so it wasn't your real choice. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so I, I, I kind of wanted to explore this notion of the, the psychologist, the academic under pressure as well, try, try, trying, trying, to, trying to make his way in this world uh, with all of these obligations but, and responsibilities. But to me, that that um, that connects up to the sense or the tone of, say, Lucky Jim, because uh, although um, a lot of the novel is is set in in rather sort of I mean what you could call difficult circumstances for psychologists, but there's there's a there's a strong comic tone in the novel and that. Especially that scene where, and I don't know whether you've invented it or whether it did happen, but when the psycho young psychologist um, is in his office and the team from the club come in and want to be tested, but then he brings his own <laughs> intervention into it and yeah. jumps into the cubicles with a machete to frighten them or startle them and then he wants to see their reaction. I mean, that kind of comic tone, is, is that something that happened or did you create that? Because it's, a, it, it's very funny. In the well, 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 you see, yeah, I mean, it, you see why it's a novel. <laughs> <laughs> I would never admit to that happening. I, 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 I was visited by, by these people quite, quite often uh, in all sorts of interesting circumstances. So I, I used to, like every academic office I've ever been in, we all have those um, metal cabinets, you know, filing cabinets. And I think mine in Sheffield was the only one famous because it had the biggest dent I've ever seen on the front. Of it. <laughs> and somebody came and punched it. And he's, what, he came he into my office and said, I don't want to punch you, but I want to punch something. And then punched the cannon. Because obviously he wanted to punch me, but he punched the cannon. So I thought, oh, I'd be relieved there. Um, so this notion of, of them turning up uh, wasn't uncommon. Uh, and they turned up everywhere. They turned up in my house, even when I hadn't given them my address, which was interesting. Um, so, I, I, and there was no getting away from it in a sense because I, I think once you, you're there and you're observing it and, and you're making observations, they expect you to, 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 you know, to interact and, and so on. So some of them set up a debt collection business and they said, could I write the advertising slogan? <laughs> <laughs> Very successful. Uh, one of them applied for a job in the probation service. He didn't get the job, but he said it was the best written application they ever had. <laughs> it's like, you, you, you have neutral, and, and any people who do criminology or ethnographic work on, on society and don't admit to this kind of stuff, you think, well, they're only telling half the story, but I, I kind of wanted to explore that, and so on, and, 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 and spell out the implications. Which is awesome. <coughs> Might be worth us just having a moment to think about the actual crafting of the book, because um, <coughs> even though you say you're not... Um, evangelical about body language, it's very useful for a novelist to be, to have an eye on body language, isn't it? I, mean, I teach quite a bit of creative writing. When you're teaching people to write, one of the things we encourage them to do is not just tell us what people say or tell us what people think, but to show it. So it's the art of learning to show, not tell. Um, and you that is your expertise, and it's Matt's expertise in the book. So he's very alert to people's gestures, people's movements, people's thoughts beneath what they say. So it really helps you to write subtext. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I should cl clarify. I, I do observe human nonverbal behaviour, <laughs> of course. But, but what I mean is, my, my particular theory is that, that the connection is with speech. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to interpret it, it's the two systems together you have to work out. And the problem with body language is people think it's separate from language. Mm -hmm. and, and so when, you, when I'm doing CCTV stuff, it's, it's just that. And, and, and the whole they knew one, of course, in the novel is that he, he misinterpreted something because he, he didn't know what was yes. being said at the time. Mm -hmm. So, so and, and you're absolutely right. And, and I'm, I'm fascinated by the notion that as a psychologist, I have a whole vocabulary and a way of looking at human behavior, yes. which is sometimes a little bit alien. You know, and, and that's why I read the bit at the start of the book. It looks a bit odd you know, when I talk about types of smiles or even types of clenching of muscles. That's the way I understand it. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily the way people understand it. And then when I'm trying to interpret what happens in a, in a, in a, in a build-up to balance, for example, that's still my way of viewing it. Um, 
So, but, but I, I agree with you in the sense that it's, isn't it interesting when you start putting those behavioral descriptions in and, and putting language into that mm -hmm. context? Because I always think that you know, literature is, is so much word-based, and yeah, you're absolutely right, it's almost as if you're forcing people to describe the yes. action. Whereas this person starts with, with the opposite yeah. perspective yeah. On, on human life. Yeah, and that's very powerful. Life. Because yeah. he sees what people are showing beneath what they're saying, doesn't it? Um, and, and also the, the book itself has quite a filmic structure, doesn't it? I wondered if you, how much work you've done structuring this material, because we've got the quiet, ventilated scenes of the grief around the brother, and then we've got these very active scenes. And we move through quite an arc of a story, don't we, towards our hero coming to a sort of understanding of his own frailties and his own limitations, but also coming to terms with who he is. And now, was that a hard arc of a story to craft as a writer? Not really. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, as I said, I've written two novels, and, and, and both of them, I, I suppose my problem is that in terms of the, you know, the, the, the structuring of a novel, you know, again, I think in psychological terms, I think, you know, I, I think that what I want to do is to build that psychological tension and then relieve the tension in some way. Okay. Um, and, I, and I suppose that um, I always laugh with the corner boys. I, I got a contract to write a novel about Belfast, and then I, I, I spent a kind of Christmas writing about this person's family background, because I always thought that any theories of the conflict in Ireland where people don't understand the relationship between boys and their mothers there haven't got it right because none of us had any dads. The dads were all dead. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that the relationship between mothers and children there, and therefore the relationship between boys and their peers, the gang, were critical. You know, and, and that's what The Corner Boys was about. And I remember my crafting of The Corner Boys, I spent the whole time writing about the boy and his mother. And then I realized I'd written 60,000 words, and I thought, I won't finish it. Mm -hmm. And I sent it to my publisher and said, well, we think it's been a great novel. <laughs> uh, but there wasn't much craft in it. It was just this description of, and, and, you know, and, and, I, and I think with this one, what I wanted to do was I wanted to, to create this, this period of time in Sheffield, in, in this demi uh and how they viewed the world, and how they were surviving, uh, despite all of the uh, firms closing down. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, on the one hand, in Sheffield at that time, you had the steel workers who were now redundant, who stayed in all day. They, well, they did their house all summer, and then, then they stayed in for most of the day, and they went to the supermarkets at times in the afternoon, and they knew they wouldn't bump into their friends because of the shame of, of being out of work. And then you had these characters who were kind of getting by, who were rather celebrating their masculinity and glorifying it through these videos, or pretending to be something they weren't. And, and getting a real buzz from that, you know, pretending to be to be a somebody in this time in which there weren't any somebody's in the world. Yeah, well, well, um, normally when I read a novel, I, my mind tries to connect it to other novels of that type. But when I was reading your novel, because there's a lot of examination of the moving image in the novel, which is either through his own work or through the work that he ends up doing, say, with the nightclub owners, it was other, it was other films that came to mind. Um, the, there was two films that came to mind. There's Red Road by Andrew Arnold, which is set in Glasgow, working class area, and it's a lot about the examination of CCTV footage of, of streets. And Sex Lies and Videotape, Stephen Soderbergh's film, which was one of the first that had that examination in a film of pre-recorded material. And <coughs> it, I find that, for me, fascinating, because I was connecting yours more to films than to books. And I wondered whether you had any sort of thoughts on, on that. The fact that you have a lot of examination of, of film footage, which isn't done as a film study, yes, yeah. but it's done as an examination of gestures and Yeah, I mean, it wasn't done consciously, but, but, but I suppose the point is, I mean, I suppose that's what I do for a living. I, you know, I watch, I watch action for a living. So perhaps it's not that surprising that, and I suppose what I wanted to do was, was to play about with the different context in which people watch each other on video and make judgments. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and to me, that's the kind of philosophical point underpinning the book, which is, you know, as I said at the start, the psychologist does it, police do it, the bouncers do it, the nightclub owners do it. You know, we all do it. We watch people that we don't know. Um, they're all reading it in different ways. And they're, they're, all, they're all reading it in different ways. Yeah. They're imputing kind of motives of, of, of different, uh, in, uh, really kind of quite discrepant. Um, and I suppose it's, it's this notion of, of, this notion of uh, 
thin slicing of behaviour and trying to understand people from thin slice behaviour, which, which is, and, and as a society, I mean, that's happening more and more, I think, you know, it's, and, and, and I think that that's what I was trying to explore, really. And, and, and as I say, the, the point about the psychologist is that they're, they're the biggest thin slices of all, you know, they're always invisible, they make judgments, they make quick judgments and then they're, they're gone again. And I suppose what I wanted to do was, was to, uh, to make, to give this person enough background information about the characters that he's watching and observing, that thin slicing is no longer a, a te logically tenable position, and he can't escape as quickly as he'd like to. Mm -hmm. Psychologists like to duck in and duck out. You know, ten minutes for an experiment is time enough. Thank you. I know enough about you now. Go. Uh, but but this is a little bit different. He's he's, he's, he's kind of stuck there. Isn't he? Time to bring in yourselves or any questions. Before we do it, then. It, this, it's set in Sheffield, so it's not the full Monty, it's the demi Monty, so to speak. Um, nearly got that. But apologies to the French language there. Um, I think there's a rogue in mind. Yep. So if you'd like to ask it, I'll just finally ask, do you think anybody will recognise themselves? Apart from yourself, who oh, will recognise yourself. Uh, yeah. But will any, will any the composite well, uh, ladies, do you think they'll recognise yeah. themselves? It does give me a wave in that. I know, yeah, it did me when I put, yeah, I've published a, some books that have yeah. absolutely quite authentic people in it. But my experience is people just don't. All yeah. they say, I think I'm this character. And you think, what? You're not that yeah. character? You know. Yeah. And it's surprising, really, that people don't recognise themselves. People are composites. I mean, I mean there's... Mm. The Lenny character, I'm sure the person would recognise that he is 80% or 70% Lenny. Yeah. Um, but. They might not be reading contemporary novels. <laughs> They'd probably read this one. Any questions? We talked a bit about screen. Do you have any. Do you write other forms? Poetry or screenplays or. You, know, you do academic works and you've done two novels. Would you like to, because I mean, I, I started just writing novels and then moved into dr radio dramas, dramas towards screenplays, and the, the forms are quite interchangeable. I wonder if you've yeah, no, no, I've done a few bit, bits and pieces. I, I, I've written a memoir uh, yes. set in, um, uh, in uh, Belfast, and I've, I've done some reportage, okay. that's what I would call it. Um, uh, so, so I, I, at the time I was writing about Shepherd, the first book was published by Chatham Mills, which was kind of reportage about, mm -hmm. about Shepherd called uh, Survivors of Still City, which was about some of the characters. Uh, and I suppose was that, sorry, was that when you worked with the, the film people in Shepherd? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so, so, in some sense, this is returning to those individuals. And, and I always thought it would be a novel after I did the Irish novel, and then they offered me a contract to do a second Irish novel. Uh, you know, but but I, this was the book I always wanted to do. You know, I always wanted to explore. This this world and, and, and you know, this you know, and, 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 and the psychology of the world. Yeah. So no screenplay version. Not no, going to no, adapt no. your own novel for the screen. No, I haven't, I haven't thought of it. <laughs> 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 That's a nice step. No. If um, if we haven't got any questions, would you like to finish with a? Well, if you want to do a reading project, can you say? You can yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Well, is there a bit that sticks in your mind? Um, well, I suppose that you know that twisty bit where. Um, he finds out about his... Okay. Uh, if you can... You find out. <laughs> 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 Should have had a post-it in there. Yeah. Do you remember? <laughs> Where is that? Okay. It's just that Roger had offered earlier to read this. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite nice to hear yeah, someone else reading saying, your yeah, work, yeah. actually. talking about, but it's um, an important um, <laughs> section where Matt and Adele, Adele is, um, uh, I suppose, his girlfriend for part of the his, his time in Sheffield, but Adele had been the girlfriend of his brother, so there's a continuing 
sort of mirror imaging that goes on between the two siblings. And um, Matt has just found out something about Adele that he didn't know, which is that... <laughs> So this is Matt and Adele, and Matt has just found out something from Adele about uh, her own um, working experience, uh, working life in Sheffield, which is uh, so she's on the game, which she didn't know. Neither of us slept in what remained of that night. We lay side by side on her bed for a few hours in her darkened bedroom, with her thick curtains keeping out the creeping, prowling dawn. We was with its nasty little secrets to reveal. We need to talk, she said, and not about me. You already know all about me, I assume, but let me tell you about your brother, she said. I'd had enough of men in this town, and then I met Phil, she said. He was different. That's all I can say. He was different. I nodded my head without looking at her. He told me all about his work in Cambridge for his psychology degree. She was smiling. That's right, Cambridge. I made a small snorting noise as if to say that I couldn't bear to hear any more of her lies. But after what had happened, I knew that the time for lies had gone. I didn't know then that it was all just made up until that first night with you, she said. I can laugh about it now. I had to look her way to get her to continue. It was a painful sight. The truth is, she continued, I used to love him, analysing me. He was so good at telling me what I was thinking and what I was feeling. Don't ask me how he did it. He was a really good psychologist. I found myself nodding emphatically. Sorry, em emphatically. Even though she added, I suppose that he picked most of, the, of that up from you. He didn't actually go to Cambridge. Is that right? I sat there trying to imagine my brother saying such false things in this room. I looked around the room and tried to imagine those words filling the fragrant air. You see, she began, I was always worried about how your mother would react to me, you being from such a posh family and all that. And Phil told me all about your big house and your dad who was the famous academic. I don't come from that type of family background at all. You see, I left home when I was 16. I got booted out. I've had, I've had to work to get by all my life. And Phil said that he understood, but not everybody is as open-minded as your brother. I didn't have the strength to tell her that all this had been lies. I had not talked to her about my, about our background. I'm not sure why. But then she slowly started to tell me all about what my brother had told her about Cambridge and my lecturer with the brown tweed jacket using his pompous alliteration to talk about the predictive power of proper science. I heard all about my own undergraduate room in Cambridge and the print of the young Chatterton on the wall opposite the window seat. I even heard details of the very first practical that I had ever done in psychology and the mark I got for it. I heard about the significance of iconic gestures and the importance of eye gaze at windows to the human soul. These all sounded better somehow, even in that room in the in the dorm, having been dressed up by my brother. It all sounded so glamorous. Down by the cam, the Maywalls, the punt on the river, the scientific breakthroughs on the microscopic analysis of human behavior. The certainty of it all, the career trajectory. She'd been enthralled with him, and he had borrowed bits of my life to keep her enthralled. I didn't realize it was all just a story, she said. He was no different to the rest of them around here. Then there was you, the youngest brother. But I saw a bit of him in you, and the stories were the same. I was hearing some of them for the second time. It was like meeting him all over again. She was laughing now, and the laughter was causing her.
to flinch with a physical pain in her tightened face. I didn't mean to hurt you. We shouldn't have got to know each other, she said. We were never right for each other. I just wanted to be reminded of him. I'm sorry. I was crying. Maybe it was shame. Maybe it was sorrow. She reached out her hand, but I, but I pushed it away. Phil always knew what I did, she said, right from the start. That's how we met. He and a friend turned up one night at the sauna where I worked, after they'd been to a club. The thought that he was getting for three what other men had to pay for, that turned him on, I think. I sat there in silence, trying to take this all in. So tell me about Phil at Orgreave, I said. Tell me about that. I wanted to remember something positive about him. I needed something. Orgreave, she said. Yes, Orgreave. He wasn't at Orgreave, she said. He was in bed with me the day of the really big battle. He had moved in with me at the time. I was looking after him. She was looking at me carefully. I was keeping him, in fact. My cousin, though, he was there. Perhaps we were just getting it a bit mixed up. My cousin was a minor. He was on strike then. I don't understand, I said. You're just a bit confused, she said. My cousin used to bring some of the food parcels up here for me and Phil. He couldn't eat them all himself. He said all these food parcels, they'd come from comrades in Russia and Poland. But they were all local brands. Heinz baked beans, tins of skimmed milk, packets of tea bags, tins of stewed meat. But even my cousin Brian didn't stay out of work that long. He got a job on the door of a club for most of the strike. I got him fixed up with that. He was getting 12 quid a night. I know that. And Brian was at Aubrey, not Phil. I sat there not speaking. I remember that, she continued, because Brian lost one of his slip-ons when he ran from the police at Orgreave, and he wanted me to go back there to look for it within the next day. Phil and I were in bed together when he was telling us all about it. Phil was creased up with laughter, hearing Brian's stories about the miners facing up to the police. He said that they were all fucking nutcases. Phil was too sensible to go anywhere like Orgreave. I sat there and she held my hand and said again that she was sorry. I didn't know what to say. I'll be working tonight, she said. Sorry, I'll not be working tonight, she said. My boss will kill me if I turn up like this. So, you've got a date tonight if you want one, she said, and she pulled me close. If you want it, that is. Thanks for the opportunity, uh, <laughs> and with only one F word, I got the best bit. I got the best yeah. bit. Um, so, if, if, is there no question? Uh, oh, uh, okay, you talk about the minor strike. What what was the time scale from then to you know what what was the time scale for the, the whole? Um, was there like an end point? Uh, um, well, it's, it's quite big, really. It, it, it's, yeah. yeah. It's really set around that minor strike period, isn't it? But yeah. Because we move back and forth in yes, his yeah. memories, yes, yeah. it feels more fluid, doesn't yes, it? Yeah. It doesn't feel like a kind of linear narrative in that way. Yeah. I suppose it could. He talks a lot about his earlier childhood, yeah. doesn't he? So you could say that it's, it's spanning the course of his life. Yes, up to that point. Up yeah. to that point, really. Yeah. So. But, but in terms of end point, it's, it's not clear what it is. Because it ends in very personal terms, I and mean, the minors provides a kind of political backdrop and, and a societal backdrop to to, you know, to, to, to what's occasioning people's lives. Really. But there's no there's no end point. There's no there's no political thing. Oh, thank God, Tony Blair said no. <laughs> we can all go home. <laughs> Thanks. Can I ask a question? Um, sure. It's actually a practical question, which is to ask um, about your your practice, your writing practice. Um, so I'm asking what's your writing practice, because clearly you're very productive in a range of fields, and you do other things as well that don't involve sitting down and writing. So just wonder sort of 
if you've got like some secret extra day in the week or something that you <laughs> yeah. use for this kind of thing? Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm quite disciplined and, and, and I'm excited by ideas. So I, I, I tend to work very intensively when I'm working and when I'm not working, I don't work. <laughs> uh, that makes sense, you know, but... Um, you get distracted by social media like everyone else. No. You don't, you don't allow that to waste your time. So, so, what, so when I'm writing, I, I, I do, I, I can focus quite, quite hard, if you know what I mean, so I'm not distracted when I'm writing. So it, there's nothing interesting about, uh, about anything, because you, you hear about writers, you know, you've, you've got you know, stru structured days, I don't even have that. I just, yeah. Well, I have to force myself to write, I have to think, right, I've got to just do it now and do it for this many hours, and then I'll stop, because it's just, uh, if you procrastinate, the day's gone, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Jeff, to what extent were you always in control of your characters? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I, well, uh, you know, I, they have a life of their own, of course, because I, th I think once you, when, once you make them plausible, I mean, this, this applies to both, both books, I, th I think once I've, I've situated them, they, they, they're capable of doing certain things on their own, so it's quite fun to see what they do next with them. Yeah. I think you feel like you know you've got the story when they do start almost like telling you their story. Telling exactly, yeah. And when you can't get to that point, it's almost like you haven't quite begun writing it. And there's a lovely point when you suddenly think, oh, I'm going downhill. It's easy, and not downhill in quality, but literally I'm just going down the hill on the bike. It's easy now because the characters have a life of their own. And, 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 and I always think my goal is, is to set up, you know, to try and create moments in time, you know, which I've, I've done my best, made my best attempt just to get, get the essence of something. And I, I think once you've created the situation, this is my way of doing it, once I've created the situation, and I kind of know a little bit about, about the individuals, yeah, yeah, you can just leave them to it. So they develop know, their own logic. They develop their own logic, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, as I say, the, the, the kind of narrator in this book is in many ways quite quite different to me. Um, but he and I have, have, have had some similar experiences, but, but, he, but, but he really is he's, he's quite a different character. He's much nicer than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to um, thank Jeff and Helen for discussing Jeff's new book, The Body's Little Secrets, and we have some for sale in the foyer, and Jeff will do some signings as well to complete the evening. And um, I hope you enjoy the book because it's, as we've been discussing, you can tell that it's a fascinating read about a recent particular moment in British history, but it covers a whole range of um, emotions within, as you can see from the last piece I, I read, within and um, between brothers and relationships to do with academic life but also the world of Sheffield in that period. Um, let's look forward to the next book, Jeff, which uh, will be out <laughs> in October. In October. <laughs> okay, thank you Jeff and Helen. Thank you.